Welcome to the second session of Corpus Linguistics. In the first session, we looked at what a corpus is. We looked at different kinds of corpora and thought about their design, their size, and whether or not we can say they are representative of the language as a whole or of a particular variety of it. And we did a few searches that looked at how a corpus can give us some insight into the meanings of words in context and how the grammar of the language, particularly a little imported grammatical suffix, changes over time. In this session, we're going to begin our more detailed exploration of corpus search tools with a consideration of frequency analysis. This is one of the basic and most powerful things we can do with a corpus. We can simply count the number of things in it. Counting things and explaining their frequency is part of what we formally call quantitative analysis. The scholarly study of the English language has a foot in two camps that of the empirical linguistic sciences and that of the traditional humanities. Our liminal position between these two camps means that those who study English have shifting attitudes towards what comprises evidence for the claims that we make about the nature of language. The more scientifically inclined amongst us search for empirical evidence that is explicit and open to objective analysis, while those who feel a greater affinity with the humanities place a greater emphasis on individual insights into case studies and the kind of interpretation of texts that, though it may be intuitively subjective, nevertheless manages to be persuasive and illuminating. Obviously, corpus linguistics seems to fall neatly into the quantitative camp. By presenting a body of texts in digitized form and constructing tools to search that body of texts automatically, Corpus Linguistics brings to the table a set of textual data and analytical tools that gives us statistical results that seem explicit and objective. And it's true that this mass of easily accessible, seemingly transparent evidence is one of the great strengths of Corpus Linguistics. However, as will become clear from this course, evidence always requires interpretation and the interpretative critical skills of the humanities researcher are still highly prized in discussions about what the quantitative results of corpus analysis might actually mean. Certainly, by using corpora and search tools, we can count linguistic features and constructions, thus identifying frequencies and distributions. And so, we can propose, in principle, reliable and generalizable statements about how language works. We might look, for example, at the relative frequency and distribution of the use of the word like in conversational recordings of older and younger speakers of English, and so conclude that there is a much greater likelihood of the word like being frequently used by younger speakers than older ones. So long as the corpus is well constructed and the search tools are reliable, then this fact is difficult to argue against. However, the mere fact that younger people tend to use the word like more frequently than older people does not tell us much about how both, both groups are using the word, and it does not tell us why younger people are using it more frequently. Other, more sophisticated statistical analyses might be used to address the question of how young people are using like. For example, is its usage also related to some other social variable, such as gender, ethnicity, or even marital status? And the issue of why certain groups of younger people have increased their frequency of use of like is even more difficult to address. For this reason, many linguists supplement quantitative analysis with interpretative qualitative analyses of corpus data. Corpora can as easily make data available for qualitative analysis as they can quantitative. Qualitative analysts use corpora not only as a source of information about frequencies and distributions, but as a source of raw data for case studies, which can be quick, quickly and easily assembled. A good corpus linguist should be able to handle both qualitative and quantitative analysis. Corpus linguists can obtain a lot of useful information simply by looking at the frequencies of items in a corpus. The number of occurrences of an item in any corpus is referred to as its raw frequency or sometimes its observed frequency. 
When looking at corpus data, we can distinguish between raw or observed frequencies and normalized or relative frequencies. For example, in O'Keefe, McCarthy and Carter samples from CanCode and the CIC corpora, the search item I, the first person pronoun, occurs 150,989 times in the spoken data and only 50,871 times in the written data. These raw frequencies are only comparable because the two sets of data are of equal size, 5 million words each. Normalized frequencies are used when comparing two data sets of unequal size, let's say the BNC corpus of 100 million words, versus COCA, currently 520 million words. Normalized frequencies usually tell us the number of occurrences that there are, or that we can expect per thousand, or sometimes per million words. So now let's try a task that explores normalized frequencies of common parts of speech in different registers of English. First, let's go to the Brigham Young University suite of corpora, choose the BNC BYU British National Corpus and click on Chart. A research question is simply this. Which of these registers, spoken, fiction, magazines, newspapers, non-academic, academic and miscellaneous, will have the highest and lowest proportion of nouns, as opposed to other parts of speech. In other words, which register is richest in nouns and which is poorest in nouns? We're also going to think about another part of speech, pronouns like he or she, him, her, it, they, them, and so on. Which register will be richest and poorest in pronouns? Will the frequency and distribution be similar to those of nouns? To find out the answer to the first question, we simply click on POS, part of speech. We choose noun all from the drop down menu, and then we click see frequency by section. Now the results page shows you a lot of information. Uh, you've got the total number of nouns uh, in the corpus, the search words, and these are technically known as the tokens. There are 21,070,129. Uh, you get the total number of tokens by counting up the number of nouns in each section. These are the raw frequencies. Um, but as you can see, each section is different in size. So uh, the really important number is the number of tokens per million words in each section. That's the normalized frequency. It's the normalized frequency that you really want to look at. Now we can do the same search again, but this time looking for pronouns rather than nouns. When we compare the results for nouns and pronouns, we can see that, as you probably guessed, spoken English has the lowest frequency of nouns, whilst written academic English has the highest frequency of nouns. However, the pattern for pronouns is completely the reverse. Spoken English this time has the highest number of pronouns, and written academic English has the lowest number of pronouns. So, congratulations, you've done the quantitative analysis. The qualitative part of the analysis when you co comes when you ask, why should this be so? Here, we must be much more tentative. As we've said, quantitative data does not provide its own analysis. But we can think about what we know about academic English and spoken English. The former, academic English, is a written register that tends to transform the world into things that can be, can be talked about, things that can be described. We would expect it, therefore, to be noun-rich, full of things, and it is. Spoken English involves face-to-face -face interaction between an I and a you, and people often talk about others, he and she. And so it's not really surprising that it's pronoun-rich. So the frequencies confirm the character of each register. Corpus linguistics research, then, confirms our long-held assumption that there are some basic differences between spoken and written language in relation to the frequency of particular linguistic items. Let's think about this in a little bit more detail. The 20 most frequent items in the CanCode corpus of speech and a written sample of the Cambridge International Corpus, or CIC, occur with the raw frequencies shown in the table on your slide. Now remember, we can compare the raw frequencies on the, of these two corpora because they are of equal sizes. Have a quick look at the table, and then we'll take a look at what the frequencies might mean, how we can describe the frequencies. 
As we would expect, the CanCode and CIC data confirms a high number of instances of the articles A and THE in both everyday speech and writing, as well as the common occurrence of the basic additive conjunction AND. However, if we look more closely at the items that occur most commonly in speech as opposed to writing, then we begin to see a pattern. I and U occur much more frequently in speech than in writing, three times as often in each case. Spoken language also has a high frequency of tokens like yeah, and markers of agreement or hesitation like mm and erm, um, which obviously don't appear so frequently in writing. Even the marker of agreement, yes, does not appear in the 50 most frequent items in the CIC written corpus. The verb no appears frequently in the spoken corpus, but further examination of the occurrences shows that this is because it very often appears in the expression I know, which like yeah, is a marker of agreement. The high frequencies of items that are peculiar to speech that we see in the CanCode data suggest that speakers use these items for the purpose of, to quote O'Keefe, McCarthy and Carter, projecting their self-image, creating good relations with their interlocutors, understanding and using the basic grammatical and logical relations that underpin the less frequent vocabulary. By offering this suggestion, O'Keefe, McCarthy and Carter are making a typical shift from reporting what the quantitative data about frequencies are to a more qualitative account of why the frequencies might be as they are. In doing so, they are combining empirical evidence about frequency with their accumulated expertise as linguists. We can do a little activity just to confirm or to challenge O'Keefe, Carter and McCarthy's findings. To check the data in the Scottish Corpus of Text and Speech, for example, go to the www Scottish Corpus AC UK website. When you've found that, click on Advanced Search and then do a refined search. We begin to do this by clicking on General and then Word Search. And then we type I know into the word phrase concordance box. Then click on General, then Document Details Spoken or Written and select Spoken Texts. Finally, click on the General Spoken Heading click on audio type and click on conversation. When the results have been displayed, scroll down the page past the concordances and look at the normalized frequencies of the use of I know in the list of conversations. You can sort this list by normalized frequency by clicking on the heading norm. In this corpus, the normalized frequency gives the number of instances of the search item per 1000 words. List the highest and lowest normalized frequencies and note the documents in which they appear. Once you've noted the documents, click on Advanced Search to start another search. Click on General, then Word Search, and type I know into the word phrase concordance box. Then click on General, Document Details, Spoken or Written, and this time select Written Texts. Click on the General Written heading and click on the text type. Then, finally, click on Prose, Nonfiction. When the results are displayed, scroll down the page and look at the normalized frequencies of the use of I know in the written texts listed. Again, the normalized frequency gives the number of instances of I know per thousand words. Sort the results by clicking on the heading Norm and note the lowest and highest normalized frequencies in the documents in which they appear. Compare your results for the spoken and written documents now. What kind of spoken documents have a low and a high frequency of instances of I know? What kind of written documents have a low and a high frequency of instances of the same phrase? Go back and look in detail at a concordance list of I know in the documents that show low and high frequencies of use. Does the use of this phrase really help to manage relations between speaker and writer and the audience? If so, how? Pause the recording and restart it after you've completed this task. Looking at the search results, the highest normalized frequency of examples of I know in the spoken part of the Scots corpus is 5.51 occurrences per thousand words in a conversation amongst secondary schoolgirls, 
while the lowest normalized frequency in the spoken part is 0.08 occurrences per thousand words in a BBC interview with a man born in the 1960s. If we look at the written section, the highest normalized frequency is 7.41, an individual occurrence in a very short poem, and the lowest is 0.02, an individual occurrence in a memoir of over 52,000 words. Despite the high normalized frequency in the short poem, overall it's clear that I know is generally used more frequently in speech than in writing. Most written texts have few actual occurrences in the Scots data. The next normalized frequency is 3.69 occurrences per thousand words, and the occurrences fall from there. By comparison, the raw frequencies can be as high as 25 in the spoken documents, and the normalized frequencies of the next few conversations are 4.33 and 3.71. Clearly, some speakers use I know a lot in speech. The question then is why? To address the question why, it's useful to look beyond the raw or even the normalized frequencies and observe the use of the phrase in context. In other words, to do a qualitative analysis. Here's an example of a passage from the Scots data from the conversation between the schoolgirls, where I know is used a lot. There are various females in this conversation, F835, 832, 833, uh, and they're using I know a lot. One is saying, but I mean, and then he was like, you know, like you're saying that North East Scotland's like the highest drug use and everything. It's only like 11% or something, isn't it? I know, yeah. But that's what he was pointing out to is that, that it wasn't as bad as it was made out to be. I know. So why is it made out to be this big? I mean, they should, instead of like criticizing, I know, 11% of Scotland should be praising what about 89% or whatever it is. I know, but I think folk just concentrate, folk just laughs, I know. So, in short, when we move from the frequencies to the actual transcript, we can do some qualitative analysis that helps explain why I know occurs so frequently in spoken English. If we look at this particular example, we can see that I know indicates agreement with the speaker. I know raises common ground between the participants in the interaction. And I know also acts as a marker that you want to start a turn or a back-channeling token in response to someone's speech. In other words, it shows that you might wish to speak now or simply acknowledges that you're listening. These functions indeed help manage the interaction and they keep relations between speakers on a good footing. The qualitative analysis and the quantitative data, therefore, are mutually illuminating. This session then has focused on frequency analysis. By now you should be able to do the following. You should be able to explain the difference between quantitative and qualitative analysis. You should be able to explain the difference between raw and normalized frequencies. You should be able to explain why it's important, indeed vital, to use normalized frequencies in certain contexts. You should be able to search some corpora for parts of speech and particular expressions. And you should be able to combine quantitative and more cautiously qualitative analysis to explain the results of your searches. There are some further frequency search activities for you to try in our online course materials, and you can also read more about frequency analysis in Chapter 2 of Exploring English with Online Corpora. Thanks for listening.